This conference will now be recorded. All right, we are being recorded. Welcome. Good to have you with us today. This is Grace Notes uh, Doctrine 305, for which we have uh, evil, leaven, loyal love, otherwise known as chesed uh, in the Hebrew, and mystery, doctrine of mystery. I'd forgotten that. So um, I'm not sure why I'd forgotten that. Maybe there aren't any quiz questions on mystery, but we'll cover it as well. And uh, we have uh, between now and five o'clock to cover these topics. So let's open with prayer and, uh, and jump right into it. Father, thank you for this day and thank you for these students. And we ask for your blessing upon our time together that you would bring to our recall that which we've read and uh, help us to relate these doctrines to um, various passages of scripture, both the ones that are uh, listed here and perhaps additional scripture passages that we've studied in other series. And uh, and again, Father, thank you for teaching us how to read with discernment, how to uh, find things that uh, that maybe we've we understand, but we've understood with different uh, vocabulary, with different um, ways to uh, to approach particular doctrines. And uh, so, just help us to uh, to relate uh, everything that we're reading for our practical application. You know, that as we live for the glory of Jesus Christ, might we be more uh, functional? Might we be more on target with your design plan and uh, and i do thank you and i praise you father in jesus christ's name amen all right well we touched on evil this morning it was good at uh, austin bible church that uh i forget if it was i think it was the genesis class it might have been the colossians class but i think it was the genesis class we were discussing satan's plan and uh, as an alternative to god's plan and that's what we get into and uh, this is actually a very useful lesson. I'm thankful for it, uh, mostly because I think um, I think there's a lot of ambiguity in, in a lot of people's thinking, and, and particularly with sin. So sin and evil as concepts sometimes get conflated, and uh, and that's uh, not good to, to conflate them, to blend them together, or mash them together into one overall concept. Because the Bible, I believe clearly, breaks them out down into two separate concepts, and uh, and we don't really find a lot of overlap in the vocabulary, the Hebrew expressions, or the Greek expressions that are used. So um, I think it's important that we recognize this because evil is older than humanity, and uh, uh, sin, as an estate, was brought about through Adam's sin, through one man's sin entered in the world, and death through sin. Uh, but evil actually preceded uh, that. And when Adam and Eve were still sinless, God had planted the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so as a concept, uh, evil predates, uh, predates humanity. And I think those are interesting concepts to, to deal with as well. And it centers on God's plan for the glorification of Jesus Christ and uh, Satan's plan for anything but, right? Anything else. And uh, this is another good um, anything but expression that we have in the Bible. And we have several where, you know, uh, you have Jews and then you have anything but. And if it's not a Jew, it's a Gentile, right? And it doesn't matter if it's a, an American or a Greek or a Roman or whatever, an African. And it doesn't matter if it's not a Jew, it's a Gentile. Because a Gentile is a term that refers to everything but a Jew. And, and likewise, evil is a good everything but expression that references um, uh, everything that's not the plan of God, uh, everything that's not uh, within the plan, consistent with the plan, uh, working towards the plan, and so forth. So, which means that a lot of evil can be, um, uh, can be apparently good. It can seem appropriate. It can it can even um, be a human good or an angelic good application, but it's uh, it's not the plan of God. And so by definition, then it becomes an expression of evil. And I think uh, this lesson does a good job to describe this, frankly, in better ways than a lot of other theological material in my Lagos library. So um, I've come to really appreciate this. I would even expand it though, because when it says God's plan, for the Lord Jesus Christ to be glorified during the church age, um, I would really expand upon that a little bit and open it up for further discussion even, 
because I believe it's it's greater than the church age, that it was the Father's plan in Israel, it was the Father's plan for the Gentiles, the Father's plan for the angels. It is the overarching plan of God that spans all dispensations, all stewardships, that everything within the bounds of time from Alpha to Omega is uh, is dedicated to the glorification of Jesus Christ. And so um, obviously the church age is a part of that. And we are um, in, a, in a big way uh, a part of that more so than any age prior to the church, but it's not limited to the church. I just wanted to highlight that as well from the from the very beginning. But this is what it comes down to. And we want to exalt Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He's taking the things of Christ and exalting Christ. And that's what uh, we should be doing. And uh, that's what we should be doing in our uh, body, in our soul, in our human spirit. Everything should be dedicated to the glory of Jesus Christ. We can appreciate that. All right. Even these fallen bodies, according to Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, You've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Our fallen bodies can be glorifying to the Lord. Ephesians 3, and this is why I think it's useful to see, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. So it's bigger than the church forever and ever. Amen. And uh, we can appreciate that too. Uh, anyway, so then we have Satan and his opposition and um, his program that opposes Christ at every turn. And he opposes Christ simply because this was the Father's good pleasure to magnify Christ. If uh, the Father had had a different pleasure, had the Father had had a different plan, then that's what um, Satan would be opposed to because fundamentally, Satan is not anti-Christ. Satan is anti-Father. He is the substitute God, the Father. And Satan will someday promote an anti-Christ because God, the Father, has promoted Christ. And so Satan, who is vowed to be like the Most High God, has to counterfeit everything that the Father does. So um, he is opposed to Christ because the Father is exalting Christ. And that's that's a huge uh, rationale for his satanic thought process. If you want more on that, by the way, I can recommend the Austin Bible Church Plan of God Reader. That's one that we go into some depth on that. Uh, Satan does not give up when a person accepts Christ as Savior. That's a fact. It's on your quiz. Uh, he doesn't just, uh, you know, hang his satanic head and say, oh, well, they got away from me. No, he continues to be hostile to us and uh, just ramps up his opposition after we're saved to get us distracted, get us where we're not growing in grace and knowledge, where we're not living in the word of God, where we're not, we're not obeying the father's purpose. If he can get us to follow the counterfeit father, then he views that as a win. And uh, anyway, good definition here. Satan's total plan or strategy is known as evil by definition. When you are serving Satan's plan, you are involved with a system of evil. And as such, then it becomes a technical term, not a generic expression, but a technical term. The biblical technical term of evil references Satan's plan that's in opposition to the plan of God. As an objective term with a specific meaning and implication. And, and this is good. In fact, 305 is interesting because it starts with evil and it ends with mystery. And uh, both of which are technical terms in the, in the Bible, specifically mystery reserved for the New Testament, but as a technical term. We'll have to uh, deal with that here before the end of this hour. Important to define our terms. If you're told to abstain from every form of evil, then uh, that leads to, well, how many forms does it have and what are those forms? And, and uh, we want to make sure you have an appropriate definition of evil that way you don't find yourself abstaining from something that you shouldn't be abstaining from uh, because if it's not evil then it's the plan of god you don't want to you don't want to abstain in that so uh we appreciate that technical and categorical meanings it is not simply a generic word referring to anything that is bad or sinful so uh, obviously, you know, sins fall within that. Sins fall under the umbrella of what we would call evil, because uh, committing a sin is never in the plan of God or the will of God. But um, 
Yeah, and I think it's useful for us to divide these terms out. And especially um, the more insidious systems of evil are the ones that don't include the flagrant, obvious, outright sin patterns. And so uh, because it's not lascivious, obvious sin patterns, um, I think not only does it fly under the radar, but a lot of people don't see the problem with engaging in those kind of activities because they've not grown in their discernment to see the evil for what it is. And because it appears to be appropriate, then uh, they don't have any problem with it. And they find themselves involved in evil. And then only after some growth in the word of God, do they really begin to understand, you know what? Um, this is not the plan of God. This is not what the father would have me doing. So anyway, I hope that makes sense. And uh, I could illustrate with some things, but um, it just kind of, there's a variety of things that, that believers can get involved in that are contrary to the plan of God. And, and even to the point where they take uh, things that are in the discretionary will of God, things that, that aren't a problem in and of themselves, but they turn them into a problem. They cause a stumbling block when, when they abuse their liberty, when, they, when their liberty causes a brother to stumble. And, and then before you know it, you can actually be involved in a system of evil when you uh, insist on exercising your liberty uh, no matter who no matter who you end up hurting in the in the process so that uh, is definitely something to to be aware of very insidious very deceptive if our gospel is veiled a veil to those who are perishing we spoke this morning in genesis about how sometimes satan's involvement is very visible and obvious like genesis 3 and then sometimes the satanic involvement is not uh, obvious it's not uh, visible or explicit like genesis 4 he, satan is not mentioned in genesis 4 uh, but the new testament commentary clearly shows that that he was satan was involved in motivating uh cain's murder of abel and uh, i'm glad we had the time to uh, to see that this morning all right man cannot solve his problems by human solutions any effective solution to a human problem is a divine solution and and part of this too i think is useful for us to ask ourselves well, what exactly is a problem <laughs> what do we mean by problems solving problems and um and i guess that would be a discussion all on its own but a problem is is a uh, expression of human finitude <laughs> the fact that we're limited we're finite creatures and because we're finite creatures issues pop up okay and uh, the the reminders and limitations of our finite health, our finite finances, our finite personal relationships, or anything like that. And so um, the fact is, we, we are finite creatures, and so we have limitations. We have problems. And uh, but God has solutions for every issue, and that's uh, that's the best uh, the best place to be is keeping yourself in the in the will of God. So any effective solution is a divine solution if you invent your own solution then um, you're not seeking god's will you're not humbling yourself before him and uh yes finitude it's a marvelous word and uh, and also remember the prescription that we have in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct our steps so uh, that's what it's about is just trusting god and walking by faith and um in all your ways, acknowledge him. Uh, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Just time and time again, uh, it's very clear that God never expects humanity to uh, to solve our, our problems or try to find human answers to these things. There are divine, there's divine provision, and that's what we should be seeking. Anything outside the plan of God is part of Satan's strategy of evil. So when you engage in it, consistently involved in it, it's going to have these effects. And uh, before long, you find your mind gets saturated with evil. I think that's the conformity to this age that Romans 12 was warning us about. So, uh, and, and it's, again, I, I just hope that we can realize a lot of it has a, a very good appearance, you know, and it might seem appropriate. It might seem like a good thing. And... Uh, but it's set up as a counterfeit to God's design. And so it's uh, even if it's packaged nicely, it is uh, it is not a good thing. <coughs> and maybe 
one easy illustration for that would be churches that depart from their purpose of equipping the saints for the work of service. And when a church abandons its mission to the uh, systematic, categorical, verse by verse teaching of the word of God, uh, and then they supplement that or they, they substitute other things, they get involved with um, building homes for the house, uh, you know, housing for the homeless or, or food pantries or uh, different social uh, action events, um, closed closets or, or any of that stuff, uh, pregnancy centers and girls in trouble or whatever. I mean, those, there's nothing wrong with those things, but they have to be put in their appropriate context and they cannot be the primary mission of a local church because that's not what a local church is designed to do. And so when a church abandons its divine purpose and substitutes something else for it, frankly, that's uh, that's evil. And you're turning what should be a good thing into an evil thing by virtue of uh, departing from God's design and uh, different ways that can be illustrated there. All right. Definitely. Social gospel, environmentalism, all kinds of things. And, you know, uh, ritualistic, uh, ritual without reality, a whole lot of religion. People think they're serving God because of different things they're involved with. But it's not God's definition of ecclesiology and, uh, and so forth. All right. Comes in many forms, and this is uh, an interesting list, and we can add to it, but altruistic humanitarianism, philanthropy. Religion, legalism, reversionism, all these systems of evil and all common in many local church contexts or individual Christians that get wrapped up in these things. To where it becomes their, their life focus rather than fixing their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Evil produces... The erroneous concept of bro brotherly love. I would say, yeah, evil uh, perverts it. Uh, Philadelphia is a biblical concept. Um, but I think the liberal form of it is the fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man aspect. And uh, that is not biblical. It's uh, if you're not born again in, by faith in Christ, then you're Satan is your father. And you don't have a brotherly love with, with Satan's offspring. They're a brood of vipers. and uh, the brotherly love that we have is with the, the brethren in Christ. So uh, anyway, there's a focus on that social act, action and all these other things. Satan, of course, is the originator of evil. And uh, one of the things that can make people function, and it's not the only thing, but arrogance is huge because it's, it's through pride or arrogance that you imitate Satan. And um, arrogant human beings are, are just putty in his hands, playthings really. Satan can uh, can make use of that in a heartbeat. So, um, but designing a, a system to oppose God, and uh, and really, uh, I'm, I'm I've been pondering what the alternative might have been had Adam and Eve uh, resisted and not not uh, uh, partaken of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if they would have simply uh, been left in God's plan and program related to divine good. All right, I missed a question here that came from Bill. Offspring, physical offspring or spiritual offspring? It'd be spiritual offspring. Every unbeliever in Adam is the seed of uh, the brood of vipers, seed of Satan. And every born again believer in Jesus Christ is, um, of course, a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, we're not getting into Nephilim or anything like that here today. So, um, Part of Satan's plan is to bring in a perfect world, and uh, you see this in a lot of places. In fact, you might be shocked if you haven't read, um, oh, there's a whole lot of writings um, that, I mean, look at uh, Hitler, look at Marx, look at uh, their writings. Much of what they wrote about was trying to bring in a, a utopia, trying to bring in a, a millennium, bringing in, uh, you know, the Third Reich was supposed to be a thousand years of glory for the for the German people. And uh, many of the promises of, of Marx and Engels was geared towards bringing in uh, this millennium on the earth through, uh, not through uh, Jesus Christ, but through uh, human political and economic action. So just make everybody equal and we'll have, uh, we'll have world peace. Uh, anyway, of course it 
has one appearance, but the reality is something entirely different. The mature believer should be able to distinguish between sin and evil. And this is what it comes down, uh, down to. And it's through practice. Solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So there's two elements there. There's the spiritual maturity element, whereby they're, they're, you're taking in meat, not milk, and you're 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 feasting on the deep things of the Word of God. But then there's also the uh, the exhale. There's also the the putting it into practice. You're living the Word of God that you're learning. So it's not just a, a Bible know-it-all who attends a thousand Bible classes and learns a bunch of stuff. A lot of times the knowledge puffs up. Um, and uh, minus the love that edifies, uh, you don't really hit this verse here in those circumstances of arrogance. I think you become a, a prisoner of war in the angelic conflict on that basis. And there's a ton of Satan servants that are Bible know-it-alls in that uh, that are in systems of evil rather than in in God's plan and program. So, passage in Hebrews that we saw not that long ago in our Austin Bible Church Hebrews series. All right. And it does start with the thinking, and uh, everything's internal before it becomes external. We know that from Matthew 6 and Matthew 15, out of the heart, the very core of your being. The, the love definition, I think, is important, too, because... Um, the world wants us to... Uh, wants us to accept sin under the label of love, and the Bible says just the opposite. So, um, you know, I've got a neighbor with a sign out front that says, uh, you know, love is love, and all these other things celebrating uh, satanic rebellion against God. Um, no, love is not love. Uh, things that are not love are not love, and here's what love is. And uh, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. So we can't uh, we can't embrace evil, and we can't embrace sin patterns and uh, under the label of love because love doesn't do that. And if we uh, if we're uh, doing that, then we we got a different definition of love. Anyway, I was glad to see First Corinthians thirteen in the lesson here. God does protect the believer, and uh, we can appreciate the promises that are made. In the scripture, the Lord will sustain the righteous, and uh, no evil will befall you. I think even the Lord's prayer has a similar, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so, uh, anyway, plenty of passages of scripture that address this. Discretion will guard you, understanding will watch over you. Delivering you from the way of evil for the man who speaks perverse things. And in a sense, it really is sim simple. It's the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. It's, it's uh, you don't have to be steeped in uh, studying these, these things out. You can study them to a point. But otherwise, you should, uh, you should just walk in humility and, and trust uh, in, in things that are above us, that we trust that we're just walking by faith and the Lord is, uh, the Lord is protecting us from these things. I can appreciate that concept as well. All right. The love of money, boy, that'll get you steeped into it. The root of all sorts of evils. Yep. <laughs> what happens if it's your Christian friend that's leading you down that path? Well, Turn away from them, warn them. Maybe you can snatch them off that path, but you can't uh, you can't follow them down that path with them. Deliver from perverse and evil men, for not all have the faith. Appreciate that. Hmm. Nice quote from Psalm 84. A day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. Rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Of course, Ecclesiastes 8. I want to be cautious, though, uh, when we get to this next section. Okay. One of these next sections here in Romans 13. The laws of divine establishment are designed to protect the citizens of, uh, of the nation from evil. And that's true. Um, what this lesson doesn't go into, though, is 
the um, circumstances where the uh, each of these elements of the laws of divine establishment are perverted, where these are maladjusted to God's design and where Satan poisons these as well. And so um, you can have a, a corrupt government that doesn't protect you from evil because it's promoting the evil. You can have corruption of marriage laws. Again, that doesn't protect you from evil. It's a promotion of evil. You can have uh, corrupt family relationships. And even though the design of family is, um, is, is to protect against evil, that's according to the design as design, but a perversion of that design uh, diminishes the value of that protection or actually uh, counteracts the value of that protection. So um, again, uh, so many of these things that we see in our generation today, they call it marriage, but it's not marriage. They call it family, but it's not family. And uh, we, we have to be aware of that. Even, uh, even volition is designed to protect from evil. That gets poisoned and attacked today. So um, there's a, a worldview and a philosophy that um, stamps out the volition of individuality because it promotes the idolatry of the collective. And so if you want to be a collectivist, then you have to stamp out the... Um, the personal exercise of volition or anybody that has uh, an opinion contrary to the collective, um, they get brutally uh, stamped down, uh, out and um, they cannot be tolerated when they are at odds with the collective. So uh, that's where volition gets perverted, marriage gets perverted, family gets perverted, nationalism gets perverted. All of God's laws of divine establishment are uh, designed to protect the citizen from evil but I think we've got a key in on this phrase here, designed to, and uh, let me add another highlight there. Let me add a couple of highlights there, making a nice orange. That uh, So when you have a, a perverted expression that's in existence, contrary to that design, uh, don't be shocked when, uh, when the evil protection is lifted and, and gone. And that's a mark of God's judgment as well. So in Romans 13, for example, when uh, we are to be in subjection, um, it doesn't affect the imperative. We, we remain in subjection regardless of whether it's a, a righteous uh, authority or an unrighteous authority. It doesn't change the, God's expectation that we stay in subjection, but it does change the uh, protective value that that, uh, that that law of divine establishment uh, provides. So. Anyway, and we can illustrate that through some other passages as well. Hate evil, love good, Amos 5. This is on my, my short list of hate verses. And uh, I was creating a database of hate verses a couple of years ago. And uh, Amos is good for that. Also Psalm 139. There's, there's a few others on my hate short list. But honestly, if you don't hate evil, I don't think you can love good in uh, in the way that God loves good. I think they go hand in hand. They're not opposites. They they are uh, flip sides of the same coin, and both must be simultaneously true. So don't fall for the either, either or dichotomy that is often thrown before us. All right, I think I'm taking too long on this first topic relationship of evil to arrogance we've already kind of highlighted that a little bit satan is the is the uh prime example of that different forms of arrogance some of those are theme expressions client nation arrogance all right yep when a when a republic plunges into empire that's the the arrogance and it's uh it's not good when rome fell from republic to empire i'm seeing parallels to that today it's interesting all right negative volition to the word of god that produces tremendous evil negative volition to the gospel anyway, this is a long section and much of this is not on the quiz anyway so i hope everybody got through it if i'm passing through anything here that you had a question on let me know Satan's counterfeit to the plan of God and religion. We've been talking about Cain and his vegetable religion, the first religious man in the world we've been looking at in Genesis chapter four. 
grace versus evil. Notice it's not good versus evil, it's grace versus evil. I like that. The plan of God to transform us through the word of God. Here's a quiz question. Divine omniscience provides discipline for evil and blessing for doctrine. You keep yourself in the word of God and you're lined up for God's blessing, but venture forth into the realms of evil and you're lining up for God's discipline. And in fact, the God's omniscient means he's way ahead of you and he knows it. <laughs> you're not fooling anybody. Certainly not fooling God. Protection from evil. Maybe this is where the Lord's Prayer comes in. But I saw it somewhere in this class. Anyway, God does protect us. He protected the Old Testament saint. He's protecting the New Testament saint. But in our protection, the hedge is lower. Because we live in the age of sifting, where Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And Jesus told Peter, he said, but I have prayed for you. So I think... The Gentiles had a protection. Israel had a protection. The church has a protection. We're certainly given armor, um, but we have more resources available to us, so God expects more. The accountability is higher, and I think we need to be aware of that. So loving God and turning away from evil, the fear of the Lord leads to life, so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. That's Proverbs 3, 7. That's not legalism. You're not a goody two-shoes and anything like that. When you're fearing God and turning away from evil, you're humbly walking with, with God. And that's a, it's a glorious thing. Okay, so that gets us down to 11. Any questions on evil? Anything I didn't cover? Any additional questions beyond what the, uh, the lesson here included? There's a pop-up comment. If man breaks societal laws, that protection removed. Well, in a, in a, in a sense, um, assuming that it's a godly government and you're living in defiance of that, well, then you're involved in a system of evil anyway. I think it probably shows an attitudinal uh, willingness to break the laws because you're already involved in, in evil thinking behind that. That's assuming you've got a righteous law and a righteous government. If you have an unrighteous law and an unrighteous government, then uh, the protection has been removed anyway. The protection was removed in giving you the unrighteous government. So that's uh, that's a different issue. I think too, you know, the protections removed if you have a uh, any of the laws that divide establishment, marriage, family. Um, when you're in a dysfunctional family with uh, abuse, with with um, just horrible things, well then. Yeah, the protections removed, and, and clearly the protections removed because what it was designed for, uh, the the current manifestation of this is not family according to God's biblical design. It's uh, it's a horribly abusive environment. So, yeah, that protection's gone. An abusive marriage environment that that protection's gone. Uh, there is protection uh, in a in a godly marriage. There's protection in in the law of divine establishment for marriage along biblical principles. Tremendous protection there, but. Um, Depart from God's plan and God's design and and uh, watch that protection just uh, dissolve away. So yeah, all the all the laws of unestablishment, although they may have a designed purpose that has a protective value, uh, variations from that designed purpose uh, definitely end that protective value. All right. Well, let's go on to uh, eleven. Because, yeah, we want to cover leaven, then loyal love, then mystery. I think evil was the longest of the sections there. I might be wrong. Loyal love was pretty long, too. But anyway, we'll see. Leaven. Leaven is bad. Leaven is never good. Nothing good is ever said about leaven. Unless... <laughs> Unless you're in a church where they are misteaching the parable Jesus gave, because there is a parable of the of the leaven that I think gets abused and taught incorrectly, uh, like the parable of the mustard seed gets taught incorrectly, like um, because there's a view that if it's growing and getting bigger, then it must be good. 
and uh, no, the leaven is actually bad. And the uh, the parable that's given uh, relates to how um, leaven spreads throughout an entire lump. And so, uh, although you may have heard a preacher preach that parable differently, uh, trying to make leaven a good thing, uh, they're trying to um, trying to do something that nowhere else in the Bible is leaven ever represented in a in a positive basis. So, um, it speaks to sin. It's a picture of sin, and uh, and so we understand that for what it is. All right, so we got good passages here, and of course the foundation for this is with Israel and their feast of unleavened bread. Here's the Matthew 13 parable: the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. That's a bad thing. That's not a good thing, and that speaks to uh, the apostasy during the tribulation. Remember, these are primarily tribulational uh, parables. They certainly apply to Israel. This is pre-Pentecost when Jesus was preaching this. The church remains a mystery. So whether it's the mustard seed or the leaven or the pearl of great price or any of these, all of these parables in the kingdom of heaven uh, messages that Jesus delivered are not church messages. Any church application is a secondary application to a kingdom of heaven message all right uh leaven represents the sophistry false arguments of the pharisees and sadducees and i i don't know i can i can see some sophistry there but i actually i just see sin i see uh, the fact that they were so steeped in their pride that uh in their self-righteousness that uh, he was warning them about this. Uh, the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, different forms of leaven. Leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And the reason why it's hypocrisy is because they think that they're righteous and they're actually sinful. You know. And it's unfortunate. By the way, I do recommend, I say this often, um, every chance I get, I think, that uh, if your only exposure to the Pharisees is through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, or I guess the book of Acts, there's some Pharisees. Um, if, if that's your only exposure to the Pharisees is the Pharisees of the first century, uh, that's unfortunate because um, the, the Pharisees of the intertestamental period, the Pharisees of the Maccabean age, the Pharisees, as they were founded and first started, they were awesome. I, I would have been a Pharisee. I would have loved me because they were biblicists. They were literal interpretationists. They were, they were faithful to the text. They stood against the Hasmoneans. When the Hasmoneans were trying to blend a priestly family with a throne, when they were taking, uh, you know, the, the, the family of Judas Maccabeus was Levitical. They were, they were a priestly family. And to claim a, uh, a throne and a, and a kingdom and to claim the title king of the Jews um, is unbiblical. The, the, the sovereignty belongs to Judah and uh, the scepter belongs to Judah till Shiloh comes. And, and uh, Levi is the priestly line, not the kingly line. So really the Maccabean era um, was, was what sparked the rise of these biblicists, these these uh, scholars with uh, a tremendous faith, and they they put their lives on the line. They uh, uh, not only in the in the war against the Greeks in fighting for their independence, but even after that, in their insistence on truth and defiance of of the Jewish Maccabean king. So uh, anyway, I've, I've got a lot of. If, if you read Josephus, Josephus was a Pharisee. If you read um, First Maccabees, if you read the Wars of the Jews, if you read uh, you're going to get a, a a better picture of the Pharisees pre Jesus, okay? And it's it's just unfortunate that by the time you get to the first century, then by this point of time, they are um, they're heavily involved in the Sanhedrin. They're very heavily involved in Jewish politics. They are uh, very prideful and very um, because they're clearly they're right. They're better than the Sadducees and they're Bible interpretations. And so by the time you get to the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel, by the time you get to anybody sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, 
is is going to be just arrogant and and that's unfortunate that's unfortunate so anyway so it stands as a warning that uh you can have the finest of teaching and plunge into systems of arrogance and and i think doctrinal bible churches need to be mindful of that that uh, particularly in a you know in a baraka heritage doctrinal bible church that uh, you've got the, the pinnacle of 20th century bible teaching and uh and man systems of pride and arrogance can can bring that down in a heartbeat so just just a warn about that all right here's a quiz question for you the sin of antinomianism this is what happens when we allow leaven to uh to affect us and for the corinthians it was the 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 terrible sin of thinking that hey it was paid for by christ we can do whatever we want to do now um the sins are paid for so have fun you know and no that's not why he saved us that's not grace Grace is not an anything goes, um, you know, fornicate to your heart's content because uh, it was paid for by Christ on the cross. Not at all. Just the opposite. And uh, so grace should motivate us um, in the uh, direction of our holiness. Anyway. So that's leaven. Ending with Galatians 5. We want to be new lumps. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. All right. Any questions on leaven? I don't think I missed anything. I see a private note, and I agree. A second private note, I agree with that too. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Um, Chesed, written by Glenn Carnegie. Uh, loyal love. This is uh, this is a marvelous thing. Can we say that the yeast of Pharisee? His legalism, the yeast of Herod was not caring. Yeah, I mean, because there were different forms of of the of the leaven. So yeah, they they're the different forms, and were to abstain from every form. But I think pride underlined both. Pride underlined the Pharisees' legalism, and pride underlined underlined uh, Herod's not caring. Okay, I'm just an agreeable person. I don't know that I agree with that. All right. Well, let's talk about Chesed. The toughest thing about Chesed is finding an English translation, um, and or even actually, it's hard to find a Greek translation. Uh, the Septuagint did different things with it, and uh, it's not a pure synonym with agape. It's not a pure synonym with charis. Uh, it's not a pure synonym with um, uh eliamasune uh it kind of is a blend of grace of mercy of love um of loyalty um the this is a truly a unique hebrew expression that um probably more than anything i guess there would there would be a consistent septuagint rendering but not always um trying to put it into any other language is gonna is gonna be difficult so anyway uh, primarily, it's a term for the stork. Okay, and that's your quiz question, and it's sad. Okay, I'm gonna tease Warren a little bit. Um, this is such a marvelous concept. Chesed. You could spend years studying Chesed and 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 all the applications we have to walk in Chesed and all these things, and um, you could craft a dozen quiz questions or more based on uh, on Chesed. And uh, this is Grace Notes lesson only only ask you the stork question. So get the stork question right and uh, you've uh, you've wrapped up your quiz questions here for Hesed. Um, anyway, the, uh, the blessings of Hesed with the love of God and the love that we're expected to receive and express, Hesed is a noun. God applies it, we're expected to apply it and uh it is it's blended frequently with truth with emeth with chesed and emeth and uh, when it comes into the new testament it comes across uh in jesus christ as grace and truth um the law was given by moses grace and truth were realized through jesus christ and so the chesed and emeth pairings are the um chorus and aletheia pairings of of the new testament um there's also tender mercies. Uh, so sometimes it's uh, it's connected with emotions, like the rahim, the uh, 
Rachmim of the Hebrew language, which I love is an Old Testament study, and it infuriates me that Islam perverts it in that one of the names for Allah is the merciful, because I don't see any mercy in Islam. Um, but um, they, uh, the, they seem to enjoy giving their Arab names, uh, calling somebody Rahman and uh, merciful, which is just a, a bastardization of true mercy. And uh, don't get me going on that. The uh, skeleton of loyal love is immutability or amuna. That's um, faithfulness and truth. The amuna, the God never changes. And then uh, the counterpart of God's justice, mishpat. And of course, righteousness, which is tzedkena. So all of these Hebrew words are all connected with chesed because chesed is used in tandem with every single one of these. And uh, it's like chesed is a noun that doesn't want to appear by itself. I, I don't know, it does sometimes, but it loves to be paired up with some of these other attributes. And in a way, all of these other attributes define chesed in its, in its sum total. So we can appreciate that. Jesus told his, uh, told his uh, the Pharisees to go and learn what this means. And uh, he, was, he was quizzing them on chesed when, uh, when Yahweh said, I desire chesed and not sacrifice. And, uh, and of course, they didn't. They didn't go learn it, and uh, he had to rebuke them for that. But Hosea 2, verses 19 through 21. And what a, what a message. The prophet Hosea that had to marry the harlot. He had to have a dysfunctional marriage, a betrayed marriage, a broken marriage. And rather than the protection that, a, that marriage was designed to offer, he enjoyed none of that because all he had was the hardship and betrayal of, of, uh, of just the, the ugliness of, of, of Gomer's unfaithfulness and uh, giving names to these kids. He doesn't even know if he's the dad of these kids or what else. And um, anyway, I love the book of Hosea. And there's a lot of doctrine there, a lot of typology there. And, and as far as an Old Testament saint is concerned, um, <laughs> I hope, I trust that uh, Hosea has a maximum reward uh, awaiting him. Because he was certainly, he was certainly asked to uh, to endure an awful lot in his ministry. And it's, it's curious to me. The text here mentions as an integral part of God's innate essence and attributes, Chesed is vast in its extent. And it's interesting to me. So in the typical essence box that we draw out, that we learn in Sunday school, or we teach in basic doctrinal studies or whatnot, we typically have sovereignty. Righteousness, justice, eternal life, immutability, um, veracity, uh, the omni attributes. Uh, you know, we, we chart these things out and then, but we don't have chesed and we don't have grace and we don't have, there's, there's things that are notably missing from the typical uh, essence box as we draw it out. And so um, I've, I've made an attempt and I need to do more with it. Um, I've, I've made an attempt to expand upon essence and attributes because i think essence and attributes they get they get uh, conflated as if they're one and the same thing and they're not um, essence is different from attributes but then i think there's other things in addition to essence and attributes and so i created an acronym some of you might remember um, and it's called pecan personality essence character attributes and nature and so I think with those five descriptives, I think we can include um, all of these elements. And I think chesed speaks to God's nature, that by nature, God is chesed. And it might not be appropriate to call chesed an attribute, and it might not be appropriate to call chesed even an, a part of the essence of God. But clearly, it's his nature. I think there's other things, too, like in God's personality. God has a sense of humor. God laughs. God, God enjoys himself and his works and his, his, uh, his persons of Trinity. God is, has a sense of humor, and that's his personality. Uh, I think the Bible also says that he's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Those are descriptions of his personality, or maybe they're descriptions of his 
character. So what kind of God is God? What is his character? What is his nature? What is his personality? What is his essence? What are his attributes? So anyway, what I hope to do at some point is to, uh, to actually craft this in a fuller study. Maybe somebody will beat me to it. If I mention it often enough, then maybe somebody will do the study ahead of me and then I can just steal what you did with it. But um, anyway, so chesed, I was interested to see chesed included here as a part of God's innate essence and attributes. Um, so it's eternal. It is without limit because everything connected to God is, is infinite and eternal. His eternal love, his eternal mercy, his eternal wisdom. Endless in time, endless in, in space, endless in value, unlimited in value. And it never runs out. Applied to us forever. Through covenant, through uh, actions to the nation, and then through actions to the individuals. Anyway, it's a good study. And I'm glad this got included here. loyal love and here you see the connections with volition marriage family and nationalism these are the laws of divine establishment which should have chesed connections in every single application appreciate that yeah the term chesedim by the way um Different pastors have tried to apply that in different cases to different believers, but loyal ones, um, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the Jews apply it because the Hasidic Jews are the, uh, the loyal ones that are loyal to their law, loyal to their observance. That's why they wear, um, they wear uh, you know, those with the long beards and the black and, and all that. They were known as the Hasidim. Bill has a question related to Genesis 22, 22. Chesed and Hazel and Peldash and yeah, Uz and Buzz, Camille, Aram, Chesed. Nope, different spelling. Yeah, in the Hebrew. Yeah, it's Chesed with a K, not Chesed with a Chet. So different spelling, but close. Moses formulated the battle cry of loyal love. And yeah, anytime you find it, it's, it is just so marvelous to, to uh, track down those usages. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a chesed and I don't have an emeth. I have an aletheia, much more feminine sounding name than emeth. If I would have named my daughter Emmett, my mother would have pitched a fit. All right. Chesed in the Psalms. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. In fact, this verse gets repeated again and again and again. Let me pull up Chesed as a word study. Two hundred and forty-five uses. Two hundred and forty-five results in two hundred and thirty-nine verses. Uh, you can chart those out. Anything jump out at you there? <laughs> okay, so when you're tracking chesed in the Old Testament and you see the usages in uh, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, um, yeah, I mean, it's glaring. It is absolutely glaring when you see the book of Psalms <laughs> and you go, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> this is where the emphasis needs to be. And I don't know, to me, you look at a picture like that and you're going, wow, okay, this, this has my attention. I can I can start that chart immediately. I say, okay, this is what I got to focus on. So, when um, when Grace Notes indicates Chesed in the Psalms, 
you understand uh, there's a reason why we want to pay attention there. So yeah, Psalm 107, Psalm 106. Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, he is good, his mercy endures forever. Well, it's his loving kindness that endures forever. So um, I think King James used a lot of mercy, but also used a lot of tender mercies, used a lot of other expressions, uh, as opposed to, the, I think of the New American Standard, maybe uh, stuck to the loving kindness more originally than other usages. I'd be curious to see, yeah. This is what the New American Standard did. Loving kindness was the dominant rendering of chesed as opposed to kindness was the second most common. In fact, loyalty was much more rare, only six times, and mercy only four times. Loyal deeds only once. So yeah, so this is the, the New American Standard rendering on these. Um, if you wanted to look at King James, then the color wheel is a little bit different. Uh, and King James really went with mercies far more frequently than anything else. And then kindly, loving kindness, goodness, favor. Yeah, so different translations did different things. Uh, the Christian Standard Bible uses faithful love more often than anything else. Um, New King James. Yeah, kind of following the example of the King James with mercy and kindness. Anyway, I hope I'm encouraging folks to make more use of their Logos Bible software because these are the kind of things that uh, you can spend hours tracking these rabbit trails down. Psalm 118. Now, this is a marvelous psalm for a lot of reasons, but it speaks to uh, deliverance. It speaks to um, God's faithfulness. And uh, Israel needs to say it. The house of Aaron needs to say it. Those who fear the Lord needs to say it. And uh, just time and time again, his chesed is everlasting. And uh, he does hear our prayers. He does answer. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And I've been quoting this a lot lately in different conversations with folks, uh, trying to uh, encourage people. I've noticed a, a very sad um, application whereby um, people are trusting in their government when we're commanded to be subject to our government. Um, but I don't trust an unbeliever. I don't trust Satan's tool. I don't trust systems of evil that are uh, in open defiance to the word of God. Why would I trust that? And when the Bible says better to trust, uh, take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man, better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes, this is what happens when you make politics your idol. And uh, it should not be an object of faith. And... Um, it's uh, it's just a it's an abuse of vocabulary when you conflate the issues of subjection with with uh, faith because we uh, our faith is to be in God and God alone or not to be uh, trusting in in government anyway so don't be shocked if some of that comes up again in Genesis or or other studies Philemon even could come up in Philemon Psalm 136 does this jump out at you? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His chesed is everlasting. And in case you didn't get it the first time around or the second or the third or the fourth, it actually gets repeated in every verse of the psalm. 26 times we read his loving kindness is everlasting. His loving kindness is everlasting. L'olam, yeah. Ki l'olam chesdo. To eternity. Olam chasdo. His loving kindness is everlasting. So if, if God took the time to repeat it 26 times in uh, in a particular psalm, then uh, he's, he's, he's driving the point home and we better pay attention. We better pay attention to it. It is a battle cry. 
It is a battle cry. Oh, did I miss one? Psalm 138.8. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, the Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Amen. Yeah, we can claim that as a personal promise, certainly. All right. And as a battle cry, based on his personal doctrinal knowledge that the Ark of the Covenant led the troops into battle in the days of Moses, Joshua and the judges, and Jehoshaphat appointed singers, um, the Song of the Ark, anyway, develops this battle cry, became an integral part of the battle strategy of the nation of Israel. So, and this is a hallelujah song, really. When, you, when you're saying give thanks to the Lord, when you're praising the Lord, then um, pretty sure that's no, it's not halal, yada. Okay, give thanks to the Lord, praise the Lord, like the name of Judah is the name of praise. So, give uh, praise to the Lord, his loving kindness is everlasting. Jeremiah 33, Ezra 3. Again, saying the Psalm of the Ark. Loyal love demands loyal love. It really does. Yeah, we receive God's mercy. We should be expressing God's mercy. We receive his chesed. We should be conduits. Same thing. Everything we receive from God, from grace to mercy to chesed, um, everything we receive, we should be conduits and just extend to others as well. How can we not? How can we not? You talk about a uh, an ungrateful recipient that is so much the object of God's chesed and then we don't extend it to other people? How dare we? What a what an insult to, uh, to what God has done for us. Yep, good verses there. Lord favors those who fear him to those who wait for his loving kindness. Hosea 6.6, 6. this is the passage that, that uh, Jesus challenged the Pharisees with. I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And the Pharisees were abusing this. In fact, they were condemning the disciples. So you have it in Matthew 9, you have it again in Matthew 12. In Matthew 9, when the Pharisees came to him and said, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? And so critical. And Jesus heard this and said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. <laughs> you know, and, and this is, these are fighting words. This is confrontational. They were terribly insulted because here's this Galilee carpenter. They didn't go to their schools that, uh, and he's, and he's talking to these, you know, this would be like today saying, uh, you know, a PhD from Harvard or Oxford or some preeminent college or, or graduate school institution and, uh, and he tells them to, to go educate themselves go learn what this means and he quotes scripture and he quotes Hosea Hosea 6 6 and then um, and of course they don't and so three chapters later he comes back to them in chapter 12 Jesus and the disciples and they're plucking grain in the fields and the Pharisees are wagging their fingers Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions? Again, this Galilee carpenter with a bunch of fishermen. And, uh, and he, he's so insulting to these Pharisees. Have you not read? You know, they didn't cover this in your school. <laughs> did, did, uh, did Gamaliel leave this out when you were sitting at his feet? Um, have you not read? And then he tells them in verse seven, if you had known what this means, and that's a counterfactual, they, they don't know what this means. And, but had they known, had they, gone, had they done what they were told when he told them three chapters ago, go and learn what this means, but they didn't, then you would not have condemned the innocent. So uh, your judgment would not have been so inferior had you done your homework and done what you were told. Anyway, Jesus keys on this, and uh, I'm glad this got included here in, uh, in this part of the lesson. 
All right, more in Hosea, not just chapter 6, chapter 10, chapter 12, chapter 4. I mean, the book is saturated with this, with this chesed. When we see, um, again, I should look back to the color wheel. I should look back to the, the verse list. Of course, you got to get through all these Psalms usages here. Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah. There you go. There's the Hosea usages. Six of them in uh, Hosea right there. There's your Hosea usages. All right. Sow with a view to righteousness and reap in accordance with chesed, loving kindness, God's mercy. Yeah, what happens when your land is given over, when there's no faithfulness? That's the amuna or the ameth that was mentioned earlier, uh, or chesed or dakath, or knowledge of God in the land. And I would say right there, that is America in 2021. No faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. All right, question from Valerie. Yes. What does God require of you, O man, but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God? Yep, absolutely. That is what is expected of us. To walk, uh, to do mishpat, and to love chesed, and to walk humbly with thy God. Yep, good verse. Couldn't remember. Micah 6 8. There it is. Thank you for that. So, all those Hosea usages, Jeremiah, God honors past generations who operated in loyal love and prophesies that future generations which will do the same. So, clearly, when there's a generation that does not, um, you know, how much can you, can you bank on a past devotion that's going to carry forward? Now we got to look forward to the future promises. And Israel has a future. Israel will walk in chesed in their millennial future. And praise God for that. All right. Well, I think that gets us through. Let's see how much more is left here. We can apply chesed as a husband to a wife, a wife to a husband, mother-in-law to daughter-in-law. There's a lot of venues in which to friends even. Apply chesed to your friends, Jonathan and David. sad how that gets perverted by the folks that are trying to find justification for their sin how fun is it going to be to meet jonathan and david in heaven these mature believers and their understanding of, of chesed all right well let's get through the rest of this i'm running out of time and we haven't even covered a mystery doctrine yet Fortunately, there's not a lot in this section that shows up on the quiz. So. Yeah. Parents and children, children and parents, extended family. So it really does form a blend between what we understand when we study grace, when we study mercy, when we study love. Because it's all of the above rolled into the chesed package. All right. Any questions on chesed? Last thing we have to deal with is mystery doctrine. Which this should be a thing all on its own, but that's okay. Mystery doctrine. You could take uh, mystery and really expand it in a lot of different ways. A lot of different applications. And I think, too... Um, when I look to, these are your quiz questions, and there are no mystery quiz questions in the 10 quiz questions to this lesson, so. But I do want to cover it, and I want to cover it because it's vital. It is absolutely vital. 
All right. Musterion is the Greek, and uh, the, the application in the New Testament is so different from the mystery religions of the first, second, and third century uh, in the Roman, the Greco-Roman world. And I think it's, it's unfortunate that um, people have taken elements from the mystery doctrines or the mystery cults, the mystery uh, uh, religions of the, the Greco-Roman world, and they have found parallels with the New Testament, with biblical Christianity, and it's just flawed from the get-go. Okay, and it starts with a, it starts with a failure to recognize what God Himself revealed in the New Testament, how God used the Musterion applications, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the mystery cults of the Greco-Roman world. So. Um, any and if anything, it goes the other direction that Satan was trying to counterfeit the church when he uh, when he instituted these these mystery cults. So um, anyway, but I think you get liberal scholarship that wants to deny divine revelation, that wants to deny um, truth, and so they take everything you can imagine from the Bible and say, well. They just ripped that off from the, the nations around them, right? There wasn't really a flood, but the pagan nations around them all had flood legends. So Moses decided to put a flood legend in, in Genesis. And, uh, and, and everything that's in the Bible, these, these theological liberals are, are far too happy to tell you, well, they stole this from here, they stole this from here, they stole this from here, okay? And uh, water baptism, that was just... They were ripping off the the practice of the Jewish proselytes, and uh, and and what's what's it would be amusing if it wasn't so sad, but what's amusing about that is it's actually the other way around. We have no proof of Jewish proselyte baptism earlier than John the Baptist, and it appears that the practices that were put into place were not put into place until the late first century, early second century that Jewish proselyte baptism actually was borrowing from Christian practices and not the other way around. And I would say it's the same thing with mystery doctrines and mystery cults, the mystery religions of the, of the Greco-Roman world, that they were ripping off concepts from the New Testament and not the other way around. So anyway, um, when you have the term and where it's found, I think it's, again, it's useful um, to look at Musterion, uh, bring up a, uh, a word study on it. Get your color wheel. It's a very boring color wheel because in the New American Standard, it's always translated as mystery or plural mysteries. There's no variety in the terms there. And uh, bring up your color wheel. Uh, search for its usages throughout the New Testament. Find its usages uh, only three in the Synoptic Gospels, and the bulk of these are Pauline. Um, you can read through the list, or you can look at a chart. Okay, so that jumps out at me. <laughs> and uh, uh, not until you get to Revelation does John ever use it. He uses it four times. Synoptic Gospels each once, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, and then everything else is Pauline. Everything else is Pauline. And uh, by the way, this is counts per book. And that may be useful for you as well, but you can also um, make it a proportional rate. Realize some of these books are a lot larger than other books. The fact that Ephesians outscores 1 Corinthians and Romans is extraordinary, especially when you look at the length of Ephesians compared to the length of Romans. So sometimes you don't want to look at counts per book. You want to look uh, and make it proportional. So uh, frequency per thousand words in the book or frequency per thousand words in the chapter. This way, uh, you're actually getting a proportional measure where you see that uh, Ephesians and Colossians are the twin towers of mystery doctrine. And um, they, they, they just, they're neck and neck right there in the Musterion usages relative to the length of those books. Ephesians is, is I think, 60% larger than Colossians. Uh, so when you equal it out based on the length of the books, uh, I think this is useful to see as well. And it really diminishes Romans and 1 Corinthians and elevates uh, 2 Thessalonians and 1 Timothy um, in that regard. All right. I hope that makes sense. 
So more than just doing count per book, sometimes it's useful to uh, to uh, get the proportional levels and uh, realize where the emphasis truly is, especially with those shorter books. Okay, so mystery, mystery. And maybe the um, another thing that's hard for us to understand in terms of mystery is the idea that when we think mystery, we're thinking about Sherlock Holmes, or we're thinking about Agatha Christie, or we're thinking about um, you know a whodunit murder mystery, and where where there's a detective who's on a case and he's trying to solve a mystery. You know, um, it was Colonel Mustard in the conservatory with a candlestick or something like that. We're trying to solve a mystery. Uh, that's not how God uses Musterion in the New Testament. Musterion speaks to a, a, a realm of doctrine that has been withheld from earlier ages, and it has been purposely left non-disclosed to earlier ages. And uh, this, is, uh, this is key. And so we see this throughout uh, Ephesians and Colossians, uh, a mystery which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. So when God talks about mystery, he's talking about realms of doctrine that he deliberately withheld. He deliberately obscured them. He deliberately chose not to reveal them to Old Testament prophets or to angels or to Gentiles or anybody before the church. But it was deliberately held in reserve, undisclosed. Things which I have not seen or ear heard or have entered into the heart of man if, if God chooses not to reveal, we're not going to make the stuff up. We're not going to figure it out for ourselves. And, and the fact that God reveals himself at all is miraculous, that he reveals himself to humanity, that he condescends to be known by his creatures. That's, that's profound. That's awesome. But that he holds certain things back. The, the secret things belong to God. The things revealed belong to us and our children forever. And so the fact that church was a secret thing until it was revealed, then unveils it for the mystery that it is. And that becomes, uh, just becomes a thrill. When you, when you can wrap your mind around that and um, understand that. So this includes all of our positional truth teachings, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what it means to be in union with Christ, what it means to, to, to be placed in Christ and have all of these church age blessings. None of this was known in the uh, in the Old Testament. They didn't have a clue. They had little glimpses now and then where they were told that things they wanted to know about weren't for them, but for a people to come. A people to come would know these things. Anyway, I encourage you to uh, to run through this uh, good material here on the secular use of muo, sec secular use of musta and mustakos. But you get into trouble though because um, these ancient Greek fraternities, these cults, really, um, they developed separately of God's revelation to the apostles and the prophets. The church was definitely not uh, adapting a uh, Gentile demonic, demonic practice in, uh, in the first century. All right, any questions on that? Are you familiar with any of the mystery doctrines? Any of the mystery, I'm sorry, mystery religions. If you have uh, Logos, I would encourage you um, open up your uh, fact book, which is this icon up here, the third icon right next to your library icon. Open up your fact book and type in mystery, and you're going to see mystery religions is one of the options there. Mystery religions as a concept, also mystery cults. And uh, work your way, if, you, if you're interested at all, if this is a curiosity factor for you, then just open it up in the fact book, read through it, uh, just read one key article if you'd like, or you can read the summary of it there. You can even find some uh, media, some artwork and inscriptions and carvings. Um, if you wanna read more than one, uh, there's no shortage of Bible encyclopedias and dictionaries that have articles on the mystery religions. Um, probably though, you'll be content with just the just the one key article which they select from the the Lexham Bible Dictionary, and you all have it. You all have the Lexham Bible Dictionary as a part of your Logos installation. 
some of these other ones you may not have the anchor uh, you may not have the um, evangelical dictionary of theology you may not have but everybody has this one as the lbd journals bib sax got some uh, articles on the mystery religions so anyway we've studied them before we've made some comments on them um, mostly to differentiate them between mystery doctrine the mystery doctrine as revealed by jesus to the apostles and the prophets is uh is what we have here and uh and essentially it's uh colossians and ephesians <laughs> it's colossians and ephesians that uh that then um i think everything that he writes then in first corinthians and romans follows the writings in colossians and ephesians uh thessalonians was written first but anyway that's the order on that all right any questions on that questions on mystery religions questions on mystery doctrine understand why the old testament didn't have a clue about mystery doctrine the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets yep colossians one mystery doctrine Ephesians 3, Mystery Doctrine. These are fundamentalists. What sets the church apart? The whole, in fact, I don't know how anyone can be confused trying to turn Israel into the Old Testament church or trying to turn the church into New Testament Israel. That is just flawed uh, on the surface because of the principle, the concept of Mystery Doctrine. The fact that the church was a mystery unknown in the Old Testament, totally different from Israel. All right, well, there you go. Let me uh, finally, let's open up 306 and see what we're doing next week. And then I'll turn your cameras back on and we'll stop our recording. So for next week, this is what we're gonna look at. A bunch of Ps, preaching, predestination, prophets and prophesying, Psalms. And then we're done with the P's. We've got responsibility of those who wait for the kingdom. So it's a good class. Look forward to that. That'll be one week from today. Okay. So cameras are back on. I will stop sharing my screen. Feel free to turn on your camera if you so desire. Aha, uh -huh, there's Wes. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you guys. Nice to see you guys. How's Iowa? Is Iowa good? I'm glad you guys could join us. Yeah. yeah. And there's Mrs. Dow. Do you remember Mrs. Dow? Of course. Lincoln? We don't see her though. Okay. You, oh, you don't see Ethel? She's on the board. Yeah, she's on camera now. Oh. Uh, sit on this side. Please sit down. All right. Well, nice to see you guys again. I don't see you. Oh, like, oh, see you. And Larry. Larry Stevens is with us today. Hello. We don't see Mrs. Dow. No, it's, it's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. She's waving. Oh, oh Mrs. Mrs. Dow is there. Hello. Maybe Hello. Wes needs to change from active cameras or who's talking or you can view everyone. I like to view active cameras. So anybody, oh, okay. that, has a, anybody that has a camera turned on, you can see them. I'm trying to figure it out. Okay. Now do you see us? I see it. six people, but I don't see you. <laughs> I'm right next to Bob. You see, it. I'll go off camera and see if that's on. 
Okay. There she is. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. Love you. Yeah. Well, appreciate y'all, everybody. Keep us in prayer. Keep our church in prayer. We got more and more folks that are coming back for face to face, which is good. We still got a handful that are staying remote. And uh, we'll see if we can corral the, the last of them in the next week or two. Well, it's good to see you guys. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Everybody have a good day. Bye.